epic stat one speedruns of statistics, Brian Stevens versus chapter seven, linear regression. Begin. Let's start with the conditions for regression. There are four conditions for regression, and three of them are the ones we learned for correlation. QQ stands for quantitative variables, and I call it QQ because two quantitative variables, QQ. You'll notice here that this condition is met because price and mileage are both quantitative variables. So we meet the two quantitative variables condition. Straight enough means that the line is generally going through the center of the data. You'll notice right here that the line is going right through the middle. Imagine this is kind of a bar of gold or a slice of pizza and it's slicing through the middle of it and going evenly on both sides. There might be a little bit of an issue here and also the points are lower on it on this side, but overall this is straight enough and the line is going through the middle of the data. If it wasn't straight enough, we might see something like a plot here where the points bend around it and this would be a not straight enough relationship for us to put a line through it because the line would not go through the middle of the data at all points. When we get to no outliers, the condition is what it says it is. It is the no outliers condition. We do not want to see outliers such as points over here or points down here that go away from the bivariate trend. So ours does not have this no outliers problem where we have outliers. We are good. We want there to be no outliers. And this plot looks very good. The last condition is plot does not thicken. And I like saying it that way because we can ask, is this condition met? And we can say, yes, this condition is met because the plot is not really getting thicker or thinner. If you look and draw strengths around it, strength bands generally, except maybe there at the end, it got a little bit stronger because it got tighter. We're not seeing this change in strength. And what would a bad example look like or one that fails the condition? You might see a plot here that has a change in strength where it's getting stronger. If you notice when your line is here, the bands around it would get stronger. It's going to get tighter, which is a stronger relationship. Now you can also have where the graph gets weaker. So let's put one here, but do the bands in reverse where the graphic is actually getting weaker. And this is also going to fail the condition because it has a change in strength. So this is not good and this fails the condition. So what's so special about this line of best fit? This line of best fit right here is the best possible line. It's going to minimize the residuals. And the residuals are how much we miss by. When we look at how far off these dots are from the line, that's their residuals. And all the residuals are going to add up to zero if we were to add up the negative and positive residuals. So the line of best fit is the best possible line to go through the data if we were to look at all possible lines. We can see the jump output here, and let's take a look at it. Here we are with some jump output and our interpretations, but it's important we can identify what we need in the output, such as price is the predicted value of the Y variable. The first value we see right here is the coefficient of the intercept or just where X is equal to zero. Next, we usually put plus, there is a minus here because the slope is negative. And now we have the coefficient of the slope and we do have the X variable and the name of the X variable. One thing I do want to point out is that these values can also be found in other jump output where you see right here we have the intercept. So this estimate of the intercept is actually B0 right here and this is B1. Very important to note that you also have your estimate of the intercept and your estimate of the slope right here and this is the name of the X variable. So it's also in this output down below. So when we look at our interpretations of the slope and the intercept, it's important we know these interpretations and we can plug in the values for them. The slope, for each one unit increase in X, we expect Y to either increase or decrease by B1. But just think about it for a moment. When you look at what the slope looks like, it's for each one unit increase in X, the change in Y that we expect. So a good way to remember that this is B1 right here is for it being each one unit increase in X. But try, pause the video here, see if you could interpret this by doing the context, because this is just the general interpretation and we need to fill it in. For each one unit increase in the mileage of a car, which would be the miles a car has on it, we would expect the price of a car in dollars to decrease, because it's negative, by 0.23 on average. So make sure you can plug in the interpretation because everything here that's underlined or bolded, we'd need to fill in for ourselves. When we do the intercept, what does the intercept mean? The intercept 
is going to be the value of y we would expect when x is equal to zero. So if you look right here, we have when x is equal to zero, we'd expect it to equal b zero. So let's go ahead and interpret this. And that's just when x is equal to zero, put in x equals zero down here at the bottom. So when x is equal to zero, when mileage of a car is equal to zero, that means it's a brand new car. So when this is a brand new car, we would expect the price of the car to equal $29,769.10. When we have a brand new car, which is a car that has zero mileage, we would expect the price of the car to equal uh, $29,769.10. Very important to know how to interpret these intercepts, but sometimes our intercept has an illogical interpretation. Let's go down here to the next page and do an example by writing one out where we'd predict somebody's height from their weight. So we can just write predicted height right here is equal to, let's go with 50 inches plus 0.2, we'll do 0.1 right here, 0.1 times weight. There we go. So now we are predicting somebody's height from their weight. But what happens if we plug in, if you were to take somebody's weight right here and plug in zero for it? If you were to plug in zero, well, that's what's solving for the intercept. That's giving you your estimate of the intercept because that's when x is equal to zero. So when someone's weight is equal to zero, we'd expect their height in inches to be 50 inches. There's two reasons that's illogical. Your weight really can't equal zero. And if your weight did equal zero for some odd reason, well, you wouldn't be 50 inches tall, I doubt. So this is a very illogical intercept. How do you know if an intercept is illogical? Interpret it. When somebody's weight is equal to zero, stop, wait. That doesn't make sense. That's illogical. So in that moment, you should know it's illogical from your interpretation. Now, when we think about the next part right here, we have the y and the y hat values. Let's go ahead and look at this and figure out where our y hat is. The y hat is the predicted value. So this is the predicted value. And the y is the actual value. So what does it mean to be the actual and the predicted? Well, if we're looking at somebody's height, this equation will give us a predicted height. So let's go ahead and plug in my weight right here. Let's say I weigh 200 pounds and we were to plug in 200 pounds. Now solving this out, we're gonna get 200 times 0.1, which is gonna be an additional 20 inches right there. So this, we'll just double check the math. Simple math, but so easy to make a mistake. 0.1 times 200, just move the decimal, there we go. And so we would add 20 inches right there plus 50, and we've solved for Brian's predicted height. So this is my predicted height. I use the equation by plugging in my weight value, the value of x, and we are getting a prediction here from the equation. So we know the predicted is what we get from the equation. So now, what is the actual value? Well, the actual value would just be my actual height. So we predicted that Brian is 70 inches tall and Brian is actually 75 inches tall. So the actual is what we observe in reality. So we have what the equation predicts, which is y hat, and then we have what is actually true. And we've also covered right now how to estimate y given an x. Right here at the end of this equation is your x variable. So it is weight, but I'm just putting x here at the moment because whatever we plug into there will solve out. Do understand that these equations need context, but you can solve this equation at any time to predict somebody's height from this equation. It might not be very accurate, we'll see, but this equation right here can make predictions if you plug in a value of x, which is just somebody's weight. Plugging in a value of x right there will solve for someone's predicted height. But how would we get the residual from this? The residual is just how much we miss by. So when we look at what a residual is, a residual is equal to the actual, we'll do this in a different color right here, the residual, E, which is the notation for it, is the actual minus the predicted. And the predicted is our y hat. But I also like to write it that the residual equals the actual minus the predicted. So all you're doing is looking at their difference. And I say residual wrap right there, easy to remember it, residual equals actual minus predicted. And we have the notation up above just to remember what it is. Now, when you think about a residual plot, we would have that all the points above the line are going to be positive residuals, and all the points below the line are gonna be negative residuals, and all the points on the line would be zero. 
So residual plots are actually going to have us looking at this. Let's go ahead and talk about what a residual plot is and what it means. So when we have a residual plot, we'd have our line of data, and then we would have all the dots around it. Now to get a residual plot, we simply take the line and make the line flat. To make the line flat, anything on the line would have a residual of zero now because the residual is how much the line misses it by. So you can see we draw the same scatter and this is actually a very good residual plot. I'm basically trying to mimic the dots I put over there on the left and this is the residual plot because it's the same plot but the line is now flat showing us how much we miss by. It's just the vertical distance is the residual. So let's say this point right here is also this point right here in the same plot then we would see its residual in the plot to the right. We'd see its vertical distance by how much it missed by when we did the prediction. And just to draw the residual accurately, it should be the vertical distance downward. So we draw it down to the line like this to see how much it missed by. But you can also see other things in a residual plot. Sometimes we get residual plots that don't look so good. So let's draw a downward line, which is all right. And here we have a curved relationship, which would not pass the straight enough condition. So if we turned this into a residual plot, what would the residual plot look like? Just take the line and make it flat. That's how we turn it into a residual plot. So here we are. Here's our residual plot. We're going to draw the same sort of thing, the same relationship as though the computer did this for us. And here is the residual plot. You'll notice that we can see the same pattern in the residual plot but now we could actually tell how much we missed by. And remember, this point right here is below the line. You can see it's vertical distance below. And so it's in the negative residual zone. These are the positive residuals. And so these are the negatives down here, and these are the positives. And then anything on the line, if there are things on the line, would have a residual of zero. So it's important to understand how residual plots show you all of the residuals. And we can calculate all these by hand. But we have some more important topics like R and R squared. So what are R and R squared? Well, R is correlation. So we have here R squared. Now this comes from our original data. If you remember our original data, it looked like the following. And this is a trick people sometimes fall into. Our original data had a relationship like this. It has an R squared now of 0.52. So how in the world could we figure out what R is from r squared. When we look at what r is, we would need to take r squared and square root it. So let's go ahead and take 0.521873, and we can get the correlation by square rooting it. And the correlation is 0.722, but not so fast, not so fast. The correlation right here is actually negative because we can see the line goes downward. So the correlation of this is 0.722, but negative 0.722. That is what the correlation is equal to for this graphic. This is the graphic originally that we first looked at, just in case you're wondering. This is the original scatter plot we dealt with at the very, very, very beginning, all the way back here. This scatter plot right here has a correlation r equal to 0. negative 0. 0.722. Make sure not to forget it's negative, and you can tell by the slope of the line. So back down here to the output, we have here r squared. And what does r squared actually mean? r squared is going to be the percent of variation in y explained by the variation in x. So when we think about this, we can do it a few ways. And let's write it out right here. We have the r squared. r squared is equal to blank percent of the variation in y is explained by the variation in x. So blank percent of the variation y is explained by the variation in x. If you remember from our previous review of this, we had that y was equal to the price of a car and x is equal to the mileage. So how many miles are on the car? So when we do this, we need to make sure to plug in the values in the context. Let's go ahead and bold and underline these so we do not forget that when we interpret these, we need to give it context. So go ahead and take a moment here and try to interpret it yourself. But all we need to do is plug in the values of x and y and do the r squared. So 52.18% of the variation in the price of a car is explained by the mileage of a car. 
So 52.18% of the variation in the price of a car is explained by the variation in the miles of a car. Make sure to know this interpretation and know how to use it. And then R squared is how much of the variation we're explaining. If you're wondering what R squared actually means, well, it's kind of how tight the points are around the line. So if we have a few different relationships here, let's draw some out. R squared is going to be higher when the points are closer to the line. So in the first one right there, we have a semi-strong relationship and maybe it has an R squared of something like 70%. So you might say 70% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So here we have 70%. Well, we could have something even stronger right here with our points. Let's go ahead and draw the points and the line and we could have points that are right around it. So with this one, we have an even stronger relationship. And now maybe this relationship, X explains, let's say, 90% of the variation. And you'll notice it's correlation squared. So 90% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. When would we have R squared equal to one? Well, if all the points are directly on the line. So if you have all the points directly on the line, here are the correlation, we have r equal to negative one and r squared, which is percent of variation explained equal to one. If you notice r squared can only be between zero and one. So r squared can only take on the values through zero through one because it's percent of variation explained. When does r squared look like zero? Well, it's when r looks like zero. And we know from our previous examples, we could have a plot like this right here, like a parabola. And now the line would explain 0% of the variation or we could have a plot where we just have a circle plot like this. And this plot right here, we can draw our circle around it. And once again, this would have a correlation equal to zero for this plot. And we'd have an R squared equal to zero. So R equals to zero and R squared equals to zero also. So this is where the line would explain none of the variation. When you think about X explains the variation of Y, and X is kind of making the line for Y right here. It's the equation that we did previously. One big thing we have to say is regression is not causation. Once again, this is just an equation. It doesn't cause anything. So do not think if that cause word is on the test, that's a word that we should just look at and be like, we are not talking about causal relationships here. This is just explaining and equations that we're using. It doesn't mean one variable causes another variable to do something. With that, we're done. Good luck and have a great night.